starting with levers. I've built this to show two different uses for the same lever. It's pivoted quite near one end. And when I pull it back and release it, there's a short, powerful movement here, which is turned into a further but weaker movement here. And this will propel the object across the room, hopefully. This lever can also be used to lift heavy weights. In this case, this long, weak force, I'm just using one finger, is turned into a short, very powerful force which lifts the three bricks. Levers are often used to make work easier, but putting less work in means you have to move the lever a greater distance. When you design a mechanism that uses a lever, remember that it moves through the arc of a circle, not in a straight line. Attached to this lever is a string which passes around the back of the train driver, through a hole in the back of his head, through the mouth, and it's then attached to his drink. As the lever is pushed down, the string is tightened and the drink is pulled up to the driver's lips. This makes the figure lean back as if he's drinking. As the lever comes back up, the driver can lean forward again. In order to keep the lever in contact with the can, I've fitted this small spring. It's quite lightly sprung, so there's not much resistance. It's just enough to keep the lever against the can. Springs are useful because they can be twisted or pulled or squashed, but still return to their original shape when the twisting, pulling or squashing stops. In this case, the spring is keeping the wings together. The first part we're going to look at on this piece of automata is the handle. This is basically a lever, which is known as a crank. Behind the handle, there's another crank. This pushes on a rod, which is attached to the horse. This pushes the horse up and down. These three automata look very different, but they all work on the same basic mechanical principle. This is known as the crank slider, and here's a larger model I've made to show you how it works. As the crank turns, it pushes the slider arm up and down through the pivot point. The position of the pivot point will affect the travel of the slider. works in the same way as a lever, but it's usually used on a rotating shaft. For instance, the pistons in a car engine move up and down, causing the crankshaft to rotate. We can use the extra motion the crank gives us to add extra movement to the pig. This is done with linkages. The legs are attached to thin strings, and as the pig rises, the strings are pulled taut, causing the legs to rise in the air. The wings are attached to thin wires. As the pig rises, the wings drop down, and as the pig falls, the wings are pushed back up by the wires.
A linkage can be made from levers, cranks and connecting rods. They are used to change the type, direction or amount of motion. This four-bar linkage turns the rotary motion of the bar on the right into the side-to-side -side motion of the bar on the left. Here, two levers are being used to make the leg kick. The first lever, in the form of a bell crank, changes the direction of motion, while the second lever, the leg, turns a small movement into a large movement. This cam and lever is the same as the ones I used in the cardboard drinking man that you saw at the start of the program. The elastic band keeps the lever in contact with the cam, while the two guides stop the lever from slipping off the edge of the cam. This is a dog chasing its towel. It works because the egg-shaped cam underneath pushes, then turns by friction, the wooden disc above it. Because this isn't very efficient, it results in the jerky movement of the dog above. This is a prototype for a cutout called the Flying Doctor. Instead of the crank slider that I used in the Flying Pig, this one uses a cam. The cam is a circle of card which is rotating off-center. The most common type of cam rotates against a follower which tracks the shape of the cam's profile. If you try to make a small cam produce large movements, you may find that the friction and leverage on the follower cause it to jam. You also need to think about which direction the cam will rotate in. The chop handoff is controlled by a large timing cam, which is driven by a motor that starts when the coin is dropped. This timing cam operates switches, which then turn on other motors. It's made from a piece of saw pipe, and the raised bits that operate the switches are made from strips of an old leather belt. The second cam is attached to the timing cam. This operates the mouth in sync with the tape recording of chop handoff's voice. The way I did this was to put a pencil lead in where this lever bar is now, play the tape while the cam revolved and just move it with my hand so the pencil lead left a mark on the cam. Once that was done, I cut out the... The bearing is the part which supports a rotating shaft. Even when the bearings are simply two holes drilled in wood, you should still make sure that they align with each other and are the right size, allowing free rotation without side movement. I spend a lot of time finding old machinery and taking it to bits to see how it works. Um, this is actually part of a ticket printing machine, and this part here is the guillotine which cuts the ticket off to the required length. If I push it across, you can see the blade goes down, chops the ticket and then comes back up again. Because this machine has to work accurately thousands of times, it's very well engineered. You can see the bearings here and here. They cut down the friction as the metal parts touch against the metal parts. You may not need to use bearings like this all the time, but they are useful in fast-moving machines or where there is a heavy load on the shaft. Cutting down on friction and helping to keep parts in alignment are useful ways to prevent wear and to keep a machine working correctly. If I need to make something that moves freely in my work, like this bicycle wheel, I use brass rods. These slide in one another, but with enough gap to allow a film of oil, which breaks down any wear that might occur. A ratchet can be used to give intermittent or stepped motion as opposed to the continuous motions we've looked at so far. The Geneva 
a wheel is another type of intermittent mechanism. It is used in cine cameras and projectors to step the film on frame by frame. The shutter opens when the wheel pauses. As well as giving stepped motion, ratchets are also used to allow rotation in one direction only. This model winch is fitted with a ratchet. This part's known as the pawl, and it locates with these teeth, meaning that I can only wind the handle in one direction. If I release the pawl, you can see what happens. When I was designing this train, I knew that some parts would need to move faster than others. This arrangement of gears gives two different speeds. The faster speed is used in this pulley, which drives the wheels and wings, while the slower speed is used on the cam, which controls the movement of the train driver. Gearing is used to change the speed and power delivered. It is possible to make gearing mechanisms which may disobey conventional rules. They may be crude and inefficient, but they can also be adequate for their purpose. I made this worm gear from an old washer which I cut, bent, and then soldered onto a brass rod. The pinwheel that it's driving is made from panel pins with their heads cut off. When the load on cogs isn't too great, they can be made quite crudely and from quite weak materials such as cardboard. The handle is connected to the small wheel with the four paddles. These push against the teeth in the gear wheel. Because this sprocket, the back sprocket, is much smaller than the pedal sprocket, it means that the pedals turn quite slowly. If I wanted to make the pedals turn more quickly, I'd need to put a bigger sprocket here. A drive is a method of connecting rotating shafts together. The drive mechanism may also involve gearing or changing the plane or direction of rotation between the shafts. The wheels on this bicycle are driven by friction, while the pedals are driven by a chain. The chain's a positive drive, that means it can't slip, whereas the wheels will slip if I put them under any resistance. On my bicycle, the road's moving. This drives the back wheel, which then drives the chain, which then drives the pedals. This is the opposite of what would happen on a real bicycle. Drives can be split into two main types, friction and positive. This is a positive drive because the chain is kept locked to the sprocket wheel by its teeth. This is a friction drive because it relies on the friction between the string and the pulley wheel. <laughs> This is a prototype I've made of a mermaid. It's made just from paper. Um, I make them from paper first just to make sure everything's going to work OK, and then I can use the paper as a pattern to cut the brass out. It's actually driven by an elastic band here. Um, elastic bands are quite good because there's a lot of friction, but they're quite bad because there's a lot of stretch. So if they're put under, under any sort of tension, they'll just um, stop, basically, and slip around the pulley. When I actually come to making this from brass, the base would probably be quite similar to this one. Um, this is the dragon. It should just slot on. The mechanics on this dragon are the same as the mermaid. This sort of drive belt used is the commercially available type that are used for model steam engines. Like, like the elastic band, they're springy and stretchy, so you get plenty of friction. Um, unlike the elastic band, they're a lot stronger and they don't stretch quite as much. There's enough friction to drive all the parts in this dragon. 